at the end. <clears throat> um, okay, so I wanted to welcome everybody um, <clears throat> to our presentation. Um, today we're going to cover self-directed learning. I just I'm just going to really briefly go over what self-directed learning is. Um, we're going to talk about the seven reasons to jump off the school bus and then cover the top nine objections that we hear a lot that come up when it comes to um, when it comes to um, jumping off that bus and, and starting with um, self-directed learning. And a lot of these even come up for just homeschooling. <clears throat> and then I'll go over some eight steps to help you guys get started if you aren't already or something to think about if you're looking like Liz said she was looking for the future. So, so some, <clears throat> some steps to help you um, move forward with that if that's where you wanna go. Um, so I'm just gonna start with a, a quick, um, just a quick um, overview of who I am and what my experience is. I worked in the um, government and some commercial IT doing web development and education um, product development for over 20 years. And in 2008, I decided to do to uh, do a lot of that work from home and be home with my with my daughter. And I started homeschooling her. And then I had um, my son and I've so I've homeschooled the kids since since 2008. We had a farm and I ran summer camps in the summer and I did homeschool classes of all sorts on the farm. We did a lot of hands-on activities and learning stuff. And then I also led a ton of field trips for the home, homeschool community over the years. Um, it was just something I love to do is, is take my kids out to, to go places and expose them to things. And so I always invited um, the homeschool community to go along with us. <clears throat> So in um, 2017, after being asked by a lot of homeschool parents to homeschool their children, which isn't legal in Virginia, I decided to go ahead and, and open a high school. And I opened a farm-based high school um, in Virginia and we ran for a few years. It was a really great program, had a lot of fun, uh, but I didn't have the, um, the, the, the ability to survive the extended closure that we got in Virginia when COVID first hit. So we ended up <clears throat> selling the farm and we had wanted to move to another state anyway and moved. And, um, and so I've pivoted to, to an online program now, an online school that helps a lot more than just the 20 kids you know, on the farm. We've hosted 22 foreign exchange students since 2011. So in addition to having a lot of homeschool experience, I have a lot of experience dealing with the public schools. And so not just our foreign exchange students in our schools where we lived, but I was also the local coordinator. So I served as the liaison for the families and the students in um, a lot of other schools in the area around me. So that's my experience. and. Um, I just, I like to help people get moving and get started and find a better direction for their kids. So that's, that's my why, that's why I'm here. Um, <clears throat> so we're gonna start by talking what, about what self-directed learning is and you'll see on the next slide, this is really short, sweet. It's really just a strategy that allows learners to direct their own learning process and you know, for different families, it means different things. Um, it, some families just deep dive and let their kid, you know, totally direct their own learning process. And some do kind of a mix of they're letting the child do some student directed learning and mixing in a little bit of curriculum. Um, <clears throat> and it's really just about what fits your family. So before we talk about um, before we talk about um, why, you know, what the objections are to, to homeschooling, I wanted to talk a, a little bit about the reasons why you'd want to get off that bus in the first place. Um, because all of the objections or most of the objections are tied back to the school and the requirements and the academics. So let's just talk about that really briefly. We're going to go over seven reasons real quickly why you might wanna reconsider what you're basing your 
objections to homeschooling and unschooling are. Um, and unschooling, by the way, is just another term for self-directed learning. So unschooling means they don't have a desk and they're not sitting at a desk and they're not doing worksheets and textbooks and, and that sort of learning. Um, it's the self-directed learning process. So seven reasons to jump off the school bus. Um, <clears throat> In, in the school system, things are chopped up. Um, in real life, everything's mixed together and mingled. And in the school, you've got subjects that are broken out. Um, so you have the English and the math and the sciences are all divided up and everything's really stovepiped and separated. And it creates, for a lot of students, it's confusing, it's out of context and the curriculum um, the curriculum doesn't make sense to them. So that's one of the reasons. Another thing is, um, as the business and military communities in the United States complain more and more about how bad their um, employee issues are because students are coming in, you know, kids are graduating and coming into the workforce um, unprepared, the, the government tries to crack down more and more on stuff. And one of the things they do is the testing. And so the testing requirements have gotten really crazy out of hand. Some students test well, some students do not test well. It's very stressful. The, um, the ranking of the schools is based almost completely on the high stakes testing. And so the competition is crazy. And more and more and more we're teaching to the test instead of actually teaching anything. Um, we kind of touched on it before the, the kids are extremely bored um, and frustrated. Some of them don't know how to handle that boredom. They act out. There's a lot of bullying and violence in the schools, a ton of bullying. It's, it's really, really, really sad. And a lot of times kids that are stressed and don't want to go to school is because they're not fitting in and they're being bullied. Um, school stifle creativity. And, um, and by the time, you know, by the time kids graduate, their, their creativity and their sense of self-worth is, is usually smushed. Um, it's, it's really, really super low. And then schools also have large class sizes. So then the <clears throat> number seven reason is, you know, your school, a lot of people put so much stock in their schools, but if you go to, um, the website is publicschoolreview.com and you can find your school in that website, publicschoolreview.com and look up your school stats. And what you may find may be shocking, but um, a lot of the schools, and, and again, they're ranking. So the, the bottom 50%, the ranking is, is based on the overall testing. But you see here on this particular school um, in Huntsville, near where we live, um, math proficiency and reading proficiencies, um, 25 to 29% of the students in the school scored below um, the proficient levels for, this, for these tests. And you'll find, um, I mean, that's a pretty huge percentage. And you'll find that, um, even when they score above it, it's still a tiny percentage of the students that are scoring um, in the higher end. So you kind of wonder what really is going in the schools. What, what are they teaching? What are the students actually remembering? Um, here's another interesting thing. There was an article in Education World and they pulled together a whole bunch of information about um, about the results of schooling in, in the workforce, in the workplace. And here's one important takeaway from that article. 17-year-olds, um, most 17-year-olds do not possess the higher order intellectual skills they need um, in life, right? That we should expect from them. Nearly 40%, and that is horrific. That is a huge number. Nearly 40% of the 17-year-olds who graduate cannot draw inf inferences from written material. Only one-fifth can write a persuasive essay, only one third can solve mathematics problems requiring several steps. And this is, this is, this is really sad. 
The business and the military leaders are complaining that they're required to spend millions of dollars annually on cost, costly remedial education and training programs just to cover the basic skills that these kids should be graduating high school with. So, um, and, and this is, you know, this is the result of some of this stuff that we were just talking about. But if you think about it for a minute, let's say with math, if you, if you think about the grading system and how this happens, let's say you take intro to algebra and you get a C um, or a 75%. 75% is a C, it's a passing grade, you move on to algebra. But what that means is 25% of the material that you covered in this basic introduction class, you didn't understand. So now you're being promoted to the next level and they're just gonna build on what you know and what you don't know, and it's gonna get worse and more frustrating. And so um, what happens is, is the kids end up graduating and their actual understanding of things is really low, but they just get passed on and passed on because of the way that we grade stuff. And the difference is when you're homeschooling, um, most of the homeschoolers I know, and um, it's different with unschooling because you're not even grading, but most of the homeschoolers I know that do textbook type stuff and traditional academics, they go to mastery. That kid doesn't move on until they get it. So when they say their kid got an A in this class, that's because they understand the material because they've done it and done it and done it until they get it and they move on. Um, it's, a huge, it's a huge difference between the two worlds. So let's talk about the nine objections to jumping off that bus. Um, and we did just talk about that bus and that bus obviously has some flat tires and some safety issues, right? The brakes are failing. So, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of reasons why you'd wanna jump off, but some people are so trained, like most of us, we're really trained to just hang on to the idea that we need that. Um, so we're gonna talk about some of these objections and um, let's see. Okay, so myth number nine, we're gonna count down or count, yeah, count down to one. Um, how are they gonna be able to work follow a schedule, make decisions and be responsible. So we're talking from an unschooling standpoint. If I let my kid wake up whenever they want to and do whatever they want during the day and go to bed whenever they want to and get little or whatever sleep they get, how is, how is that gonna translate to the real world when they graduate? Um, it's really hard to explain how or why it happens, but it does. I've seen it over and over and over and over again. Um, and, um, I literally know dozens of unschooled kids that have graduated and they've gone on to pursue their interests and they've gone into colleges and trade schools and careers and, and, um, none of them failed at that whole adulting process. They were all able to manage it. And I think the reason is because it's not something that is not something they're learning in a classroom, you know, how to, how to adult and how to live. Um, this is something they're going to learn by example. You're teaching them all the time. Your example and any other adult that's prominent in their life is providing this training. Um, kids are a do as I do creature, not a do as I say. So your child is going to learn more from watching you and other influences are in their lives than they're going to learn from anything that's taught in school. And I'll give you an example. I unschooled my daughter. Um, we started unschooling, uh, we started homeschooling in 2008. I think it was 2011 when I um, made the switch to unschooling. And I, I, <laughs> I did not do that willingly. I'll tell you that story later. Um, she woke up when she wanted. Um, she she um, is very focused and much more active later in the day. Uh, she got, um, she, she's 21 now, and she just got a remote customer service job, and it starts at one o'clock in the afternoon, and it ends at 9.30 at night, and this job is perfect for her. You know, she sets her schedule. She wakes up when she needs to. She's got time during the day to get things done that most nine to fivers can't do, and she gets to help people, which she loves, and she works during her mental uptime. So a lot of us, you know, we're trained not only, okay, well, they need algebra and they need this and they need that, but they need to, um, 
they need to be ready for a nine to five job. And it's not true. There's uh, tons of jobs. And especially now with all the remote stuff that's going on, there's a lot of stuff that happens um, outside those nine to five hours. So I'm gonna say um, um, that that myth is probably pretty much busted. So number eight, how are they gonna learn to sit, sit still and be quiet when they need to? And I thought this was an interesting question. I, I went out and I did a poll in a whole bunch of groups and um, compiled all the questions. And this one came up a little bit. Um, I think it's interesting. I haven't met a homeschooler or an unschooler yet that can't sit quietly either, um, either of their own volition or because they're in a setting where it's required. Um, unless they're young or they've got extreme ADHD and both of those afflictions happen to children that are in all learning disciplines, private school, public school, homeschool, unschooled. So um, learning to sit still and be quiet isn't, isn't something that's a, a difficult process for these kids. Um, so, and, and what I have noticed though, is when the kids are in a, are forced to sit at a desk, whether it's for homeschool or in a classroom in a school, um, if they're forced to sit at a desk and they're learning disconnected things that they're not interested and in, don't understand um, the, the, the need for it, they are gonna have a hard time sitting still because they're, they're, they're not happy, they're miserable. So there is that um, caveat, but again, that happens to all kids in every learning environment. Okay, so, um, so number seven, how are they gonna be well-rounded if they focus on one thing? Well, this is a really good question and we briefly touched on this. So in school, what is deemed important is extracted. Um, into different categories and subjects. So you have math, you have English, you have chemistry, you have biology, you have this, you have that. Um, and then in order for the kids to be well-rounded when we've extracted everything into its own little categories, we have to make them study things from each one of those categories to get that well-roundedness. But um, the, the interesting thing about that is um, in real life, we don't separate stuff like that. So if kids are learning like we live, they're learning um, all kinds of stuff that has um, deep connections to other kinds of things. And they're, they're learning to read and research and write, and they're learning about the history of whatever it is that they're interested in. So, I mean, the, when, you, when it's a more holistic approach like that, they are just naturally well-rounded. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot to be said for that. And a lot of times they don't even realize they're studying things that are in quote, another topic area. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, with the farm school, um, one day we were on a, we were coming back from a field trip with the kids and um, one of the students, well, they were all talking about things they hated in school. And um, one of the students piped up and he's like, oh, I hate science. And I, I had to, you know, I wasn't involved in the conversation. I was just listening until that point because I thought it was interesting. At the farm school, it was a real heavy science curriculum as it were, but because everything was blended, um, they didn't realize they were studying science. So I asked him, I was like, Judson, what do you mean um, you don't like science? Because everything you do, here at the school is science. And he said, oh, um, well, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about this school. I'm talking about in school when you sit at a desk and you're reading it from a textbook. He's like, I hate science. So it's sad when kids think that whatever topic or subject that they hate is because they're just forced to sit and read it out of a textbook. So when they get to apply the science and be, you know, and it's part of the whole thing, they, they love it. It's, it's a completely different situation. So myth number six, they're not going to be properly socialized. <laughs> and I can tell you as a homeschooler in the homeschooling community, this is a hot button for us. 
And nothing makes our eyes roll further back into our heads than when somebody makes this comment. And I get it. I can see, I can see why uh, one would think this. But let's compare so so socialization between the classroom setting and the homeschool setting. So in a classroom, and like I said, I had a ton of foreign, foreign exchange students that I was responsible for in different schools and different situations. And I can tell you right now, 100% across the board, those kids were all shocked. And I'm, I'm students from all countries, you know, like all kinds of different countries. And they were shocked, shocked, shocked by the classroom behavior um, in our typical high schools. So if you walk into a high school classroom, you know, a couple of minutes before class has started, this is when the quote socialization can occur in school, this and at lunch. And what is happening is you've got girls sitting in boys' laps and they're making out. You've got kids throwing things. You've got kids bullying people and harassing other kids. You've got kids mouthing off to the teacher who's trying to get ready for the class. You've got kids that are hiding and trying not to be seen so they don't get bullied. And this is what socialization looks like in school. And if you don't believe me, visit your school. Um, this is not socialization, sadly. And um, you know, sometimes when they're in sports, they get a, maybe a better thing of class of, of socialization, but homeschool kids can do sports too. So um, in the classroom and in within the walls of the school itself, socialization is a horrible thing. And most kids are so miserable um, because of the way that it's, it's done there that um, they don't even want to go to school. You know, it's too depressing for them. So real socialization actually happens outside the walls of the school. And it involves communication with people all ages, not just people your age. So in real life, when you're out working and doing your job, you know, doing your job or going to the store or whatever it is that you're doing, going on a hike, you're going to come across people of all ages. And socialization happens within that much bigger um, world and realm. So, um, it, it happens outside the walls of the schools. Most kids, um, I've noticed the kids that are, are that attend public schools are even afraid to talk to adults. Um, they're afraid to raise their hand and ask the teacher question. Most of them are, some of them will. Um, th and then that carries out into the real world. They're afraid to place their order at the restaurant. You know, they're afraid to, to talk to adults, whereas homeschool kids won't shut up. You know, it's, they're not afraid to talk to anybody. Um, generally, I mean, you always have those rare introverts, but but um, for the most part, um, the socialization is actually quite different, and it's I feel it's much more positive um, outside the school. So, myth number five: they won't have a study stamina. I have seen. I, this is a legitimate concern, and I get it. If your kid is doing whatever they want how on earth are they going to make it in college? Um, and the funny thing is, I've seen it, I've seen this myth busted over and over again. I have a friend um, and a men my mentor in this whole self-directed learning process, um, was a, a teacher in the public school system in um, California, and he retired. And he works, he worked for years, um, helping self-directed learners leave the school system and strike out on their own. And over 20 years, he's graduated almost 1,600 kids. And um, many, many of them have gone on to trade schools, community colleges, universities, and Ivy League schools. A massive percentage of them are incredibly happy and um, successful with whatever success looks like to them. And, um, and, and that's what's important. But what we find is when these kids want it, when they go to college, they want to go to college. They're not like the average 17 or 18 year old whose parent says, you're going to go to college now. And they have no clue. They figured out what they love. They found their passion and they want to go study it and they will do whatever it takes to make that work. So if they have to take a class on how to study, they do it. But, but chances are most of them are so good at research and communicating their ideas by the time they get there that um, they don't have any problems and they're at the top of their class. 
Um, so kids that learn to act, research, and learn independently can deep dive into their topics to whatever depth is necessary. And they don't really have a hard time um, with the whole study thing. All right, so myth number four, they won't learn what is required or necessary. And so we, we've touched on this a couple of times. So by whose definition, definition are we talking? The Department of Education and the federal government is what determines what is required or necessary. And um, they haven't been doing a bang up job with education so far. So we're, we're putting our trust maybe in the wrong place. Um, I think instead of trusting the Department of Education and the government in a school system that's failing um, more failing us, you know, overall, uh, more and more every year, we should put our trust in our children. Um, because that's, um, you know, th that's where we need to be putting our trust. And, and let me tell you, when you do that, um, when you learn to trust that your children will find their way like this, it, it does great things for your relationship with them and um, for their self-esteem as well. So um, I'm going to say this one is busted because what's truly necessary for navigating life and careers and family has never been taught in school. Um, and so that's what the kids learn when they're homeschooling and when they're unschooling. All right, so myth number three, they're not gonna be ready for college. Uh, we've, we actually touched on this as well. Um, we hosted a summit in November for families with high schoolers who were interested in this very topic. And I'm, ac I'm actually working on um, redoing the replays and I'll post them in that group, the alternatives to high school group. Um, I wanted to add some time stamping and stuff to those. So when, once I get that done, I'm gonna post them all up there, but there's a ton of good information. Um, we invited um, folks from representatives from community college, trade schools, four-year college. We had an expert who did um, CLEP and alternative programs and dual enrollment, um, just the many, many, many different options out there available for homeschooled and unschooled kids that want to go into college. Um, and um, and I'm telling you what we heard from the folks that were on the summit with us and from other colleges is that more and more and more, the colleges are looking to the homeschool community for their, for their achievers um, because those are the kids that end up doing well. And some of them are even dropping uh, SATs and stuff like that because the folks that necessarily um, score well in the SATs aren't sitting well and you know they're not they're not doing well in in the school so most colleges have come to the conclusion that alternative alternatively educated youth are making better college students a lot of them even have a specific admissions personnel that help guide and navigate the students um, in their admissions process and in our school, our programs, that's one of the tracks that we do too. We have counselors that work one-on-one -on -one with the student, their college of choice, and help them navigate um, all of that. And um, it's, it's not as difficult as you might think. As a matter of fact, it's, it's, it's getting easier and easier as time goes on. So myth number two, what if they go back to public school? They're gonna be behind. Well, okay. This, this one, we're not gonna be able to completely bust. Um, things happen, situations change, you know, we understand all that. So the truth about this one is it does vary by state and by local districts. And some districts are really friendly and love your kids and they'll do whatever it takes to keep them moving forward positively. And some of them have a real bug in their, you know what, about homeschooling and they're gonna make it as difficult as possible. Um, and there, nobody has any control over that. Um, some of them accept a transcript. Some of them make the students test to see where their competencies are and uh, place them accordingly. Um, I know districts in Virginia that simply make the students start at 10th grade, they don't care. Um, and if, if this is the case, um, regardless of where your, 
your child has been sitting, you know, at, at a table or doing um, unschooling, um, it's there. It, it just it's it's all across the board. And sometimes it is difficult to get your kid back into high school. So I'll, um, I'm going to say, though, um, when they do get in, they're usually at the top of their class and they communicate well with adults. So they're the ones talking to the teacher and asking questions and, and being um, more of a part and more engaged in it. Um, now, if you have younger kids, younger kids, they're not in high school yet, it doesn't matter. You can get them back into school really, really easily. It's just age appropriate. They don't test um, and the kids that go from homeschool back into the um, school system do, do really, really well because they're usually ahead of their peers in the thing. Um, but um, for the high schoolers, you know, if your situation changes and you find that you, you can't be home or, or you, have, you, know, you have to work or whatever, and you wanna put your kid back in school, you could consider as well that you've trusted them this far they're probably legal to be home, right? Um, they could continue their educational journey independently like they already were. Um, and we have programs in our school where we help, you know, our, our programs. So even if the parent can't be at home, um, we continue to help guide the, the student and help keep them accountable. And so there's there's umbrella schools and there's other situations where you can you can do that as well. So there's there's other options out there if it becomes necessary. Um, so myth number one, uh, but my kids are going to just sit on their internet, on their you know on the on their whatever their device is on the internet all day long, and they're not going to learn anything. And I, <laughs> this is like the number one argument I hear it all day long. And I'm going to share with you my road to unschooling um, because this is exactly what happened to me, right? Um, so in 2011, I was working um, as a contractor for NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration in their, um, in their ocean science research department. And the next phase of the project, they were like, hey, we really want you on this, but you need to be up here. And up here meant a three hour journey each way um, to Silver Spring, uh, Maryland, where they were. And I, my dad was living with us and, um, and I talked to him and I talked to my family about it and I really wanted the opportunity. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm not um, I won't be here to homeschool my kids. And dad, my dad's like, hey, I got this. It's, you know, you go, <laughs> do your thing. So three days a week I commuted and the other two days I was too exhausted to care. So, and I had, you know, still had contract work to do at home. So months went by. This was only supposed to be a three month gig. It turned into a six month gig. It turned into a year. Months are going by. I've got my littlest one is playing with Legos all day and everybody keeps buying him bigger and bigger kits and he's just building and building. And my daughter is literally watching anime 24 seven, the good stuff. And um, 24 seven watching anime. And I'm thinking, oh my God, they're getting behind. They're, they're gonna, this, this is terrible. And I was getting really super stressed up about it. And a homeschooling friend of mine said, look, if, if they just, you know, don't worry about it. It'll be fine. And I'm like, no, no, it's not going to be fine. I was really stressed up. I get it. You know, um, they weren't doing their subjects. And um, then next thing I know, my daughter's asking for Duolingo and she's learning Japanese and she's studying Japanese culture and she's going to Japan this year. And we started hosting Japanese exchange students every summer from 2011 and on through the 4-H program. And, um, and then she started a business and she, you know, they ask questions, they start reading, reading up on things, they, they start doing research. Um, my son got into um, religions and cultures because of his Indiana Jones and the kingdom of the crystal skull. And, you know, I was sitting in a, um, I was sitting in a, a, a high school office for one of my, um, one of, not my exchange student, but one that I was working with. 
and um, we were waiting for the guidance counselor and there was a, an adult in the in the room and my son was like seven and um they started talking about religion and culture and he had a 45 minute conversation with a cultural specialist i found out he was the teacher of the religion and culture studies at the high school and they had an amazing conversation about god and about all kinds of stuff you know and and i just sat there fascinated he was seven seven so it happens trust me it happens they don't just sit and play all day that brain starts working and they they are curious creatures really curious and if you trust them and trust the process it's going to happen now i will put a caveat here and i'm going to hand this over to um i'm going to hand this over to my friend gina because um the internet is um the internet can be a really amazing magical place of learning and it can also be a dangerous dangerous place and I did not know in 2011 about the how easy it was for stuff to come up and what my, my son was exposed to porn at a very early age and it scared the living snot out of me we had big discussions about it and now there's ways of protecting your family from this and working with your family for screen time so they're not just always on their screens and my friend Gina does this and she has such an amazing program. I love that it, how it's worked um, for us and I love how it's helping other people. So I'm gonna let her jump on here because she's gonna give you some tips. If you're interested in going down this path with your kid and you're concerned about the internet and screen time, I have a solution for you and that's Gina. So um, Gina, are you on here? I'm gonna stop my I share. Definitely, okay. I am here. I have been listening to all your amazing information. <laughs> Thanks. So let me, I think I need to make you a co-host yep. and which I just did. And I'm gonna let you share because I think, you know, if we're giving folks information on how to navigate um, unschooling, that this is going to be information that they really need to to make that happen. So I'm going to turn it over to you for a couple minutes. Awesome. Do you see my screen? Is it working okay? I do. Awesome. I do. Awesome. Well, welcome everyone who's able to join us. Um, I really appreciate listening to Terry and all her knowledge. I mean, she is so knowledgeable. Every time I listen to her, I'm just blown away about how needed this information is to get out there. And I think it's awesome that we're partnering together. I would like to just share with you a little bit about my story and um, some solutions around this. And I just, I want to help kind of blow the, the, the myth of this a little bit because kids, even in public school, are on their devices so much more than we even can imagine. And especially during the times where they've had to be out of school temporarily. And it, it does not have to be that way at home. And so you have actually more flexibility than you do if they're in a public school. And you're also more aware of um, when they're with others, what's going on behind their friends' screen. So let's just pop in here and share a little bit about who I am. So I have seven kids. I have one teenager left at home. He's much taller than me, as you can see in my picture. We are a blended biracial family. I have 25 years in technology and 13 of those years was working with education data from early childhood education all the way through college graduation and even into the second year of college, I mean of their career. So I studied the data, I did a lot of research, I provided um, data analytics to different groups. And um, I loved, my, my favorite part of my job was mentoring others and helping um, educate others. One of the things that we know that we're concerned about when it comes to our children on devices is the flip that has happened with the circle of influence and how it's completely disrupted now by the internet being in their pocket. And as parents, when we hand over a device, we're really handing over that window. And so we need to think about what we can do around that because it gets really cloudy, things get really um, disoriented, and we're really shifting away from 
what the core values need to be for the child. Now, this isn't about controlling them. This isn't about helicopter parenting. This is really just understanding brain development and what is going on. So we know that this is a, a concern. What's happening with overexposure and culture immersion is that it's disrupting the and prematuring, premature disruptions basically of the natural flow for our children to have autonomy. So we know we want our kids to have autonomy. We're not trying to block them from entertainment, but we do wanna make sure they're not getting the information at the wrong time. And so we're seeing a huge jump that in eight to 11 year olds are now having access to pornography. They're having access to uh, violence, all kinds of things. And it's causing anxiety disorders, um, a lot of questioning of, on, on identity. And I'm not here to judge anyone with their identity, as, especially gender fluidity is a really, really big topic in social media. It's just that parents need to be aware of where kids are getting their information because a lot of it is just disinformation and, and, and not informative for kids. And they're going to have questions and be confused. So when we think about that, I like to use the analogy of home security because we, we put a lot of work to making sure our homes are secure and we secure our homes because we're concerned about protecting what's inside from any outside influences. So we really need to kind of take that methodology and think about all these devices. And there are things that we can do to do that. And like I said, in a homeschool environment or at home environment, you do have a lot more control than, than a lot of the public schools. I have um, friends that are in the public schools that send me pictures of cell phones stacked up on their desk because the kids are not paying attention. They're on their phones majority of the time. In fact, sadly, even a couple of weeks ago, my son got an email home that he was on his phone um, during class. And so we had to even have a conversation about that. So I want to just walk through why it's so complicated and all the different layers that parents are looking at when they think about technology and um, what's going on behind the screens and all the access points. So I'm just going to go through here just to kind of help us see we have the way they connect to the Internet, which was the data and the and the Wi-Fi. And then we have these secondary proxies, which could be Bluetooth and hotspots, VPNs. And then we go to the layer of the operating systems. So we have lots of different operating systems that are overlaying. Then we have all the different devices. And then we just overlay again. Now we have the streaming and the gaming devices. And even if it's cable, how do we, uh, how do we manage that with our kids? And then we have the layer of apps. And the layer of apps, I think one of the things that we just really have to be educated on is that the apps, their investment is to sell whatever they're trying to advertise through the apps. And so they don't have very much consideration around kids or parents and parent controls. They don't, they don't have the time and money to, to invest in that because what they're really wanting is to make money for, for their sales. So every single one of these apps has access to pornography. It's really hard to, to imagine, but even on Pinterest, and so we just need to really think about um, what we can do. So one of the things that I even came across in the last 24 hours was that kids are communicating through Spotify by changing the title of their playlist with one another. And a mother had found that uh, a, her daughter was trying to uh, sneak out by uh, her and her boyfriend using the playlist title that they had shared. So there's all kinds of things that are going on. And so um, when we think about that, it's very complex. There are a lot of solutions. There's a lot of ways that we can manage these things. So here's kind of the average family. It, it, in some households, it's three times as much as this. In others, it's maybe half or a third. So I'm just kind of doing the average here. I know some households that have a TV in every single room, have a laptop or a computer in every single room. Every child has a phone and even a, a tablet. And they might have two or three different gaming devices. I don't have any judgment. There's no judgment here with me at all. My concern is we got to wake up. We got to make sure that we're not only 
locking these things down and setting up the devices in a proper way with settings, but we're having the conversation because it's not always about the negative stuff behind the screen. It's also the physical um, things that's doing to our bodies. So the two things that I want to bring to you today, the two fixes, these are free. Doesn't, it's not going to cost you any money to do these two things. And it's going to provide you with probably 80% of what you need to make sure that you're aware of what's happening on your child's devices. Now, we do have some kiddos that are really, really brainy, and they are going to figure out ways to get around these. And so um, in, in what I teach and what I help parents understand is I have 60 ways that kids are breaking through um, child settings. And I have the ways that we can um, implement different, different software solutions, different ways we can make sure that the actual settings are correct so that that way we're uh, really protecting our kids. So when we look at number one, we're really, we can group all the devices by their operating systems. And then we can set the settings that, so it goes all across all those, those um, particular systems. So for example, if your child has an iOS, an Apple, um, iPad and an Apple phone, whatever you set up through family sharing will actually be work on, on both of those devices at the same time. And so it's super helpful to manage screen time that way, to manage um, what apps they can access, how much time on the apps, who they can call, who they can text. Like I said, I don't promote helicopter parenting or over control because we really want our kids to learn. But one thing that I do teach about is the balance between trusting our kids to the brain development that they have to be trusted versus trusting them until they fail to learn um, what they need to learn. It's too risky. It's just too risky with the amount of um, dangers that are out there. So we really want to make sure we're building trust by building the building blocks of how much access what they have access to and increase that as they grow so they can be healthy adults and learn these things themselves. Number two is the router and profile settings. So you can um, set up your router. So, and usually almost every router, there's been a couple that I've worked with, but almost every router now comes with an app. And so you can download the app and you can create profiles and you can group all of the child's things into that particular um, profile. There's a couple of reasons this is super helpful. One is it really can manage the, the Wi-Fi time. You can even set on devices like a phone that all their apps have to use Wi-Fi so that you buy, don't have to worry about them bypassing that with data. So you have a better layer now of knowing when they are on and when they're off. The other thing is that um, I think people sometimes aren't fully aware of is with the gaming systems, there's a lot that they can do. So I was just speaking with someone who has the ocular glasses, the, the I think Oculus might, might be the right term, but it's the 3D glasses. And one thing that parents don't know, because when they usually try them on and test them, the kid says, hey, try this game, this game on uh, because I want you to see what it looks like. And there's a big elephant running at them or something, right? They don't realize if they go to the home screen, they actually can go right to the internet. And so you can help by blocking that through your router by making sure it's it's somewhat protected through age appropriate stuff. So there's just a lot to learn about these particular categories, but once you have them set up, they literally work for you. So for example, my child child one has all his devices on the router in a certain way. So you know he he has to be he can't get on first thing in the morning because his devices don't even have access. And then he has to get off at a certain time because the device is shut down. It, it manages itself. Now there's times he might wanna, he might need something. And so the way that these routers are set up with their apps and the way that grouping is set up is they can actually just send you a message through a device that says, hey, I need more screen time. Or they can yell it from the other room and say, hey, I need more screen time. And you can just go to your device and do that. The last thing I want to make sure that we really think about is this guest uh, spot I have here. So I have a guest profile on my um, router. So when I when anyone comes in my house and if they um, get access to my router, which more and more devices now are able just to go close to a, an, a, a device. So for example, my son can, can, can have his device connected to our internet 
and his friend can come over and have an, an, a, an Apple device that isn't connected. But if they get close enough, it can actually ask my son for permission and he can say yes. And now this friend has access to my internet. So I get an alert on my app that says, hey, someone's on your Wi-Fi. And then I can just toss them right into that guest device section. And then they don't, I don't have to worry. They're not going to be able to get anywhere. They're, they're either, um, they're at a child, the lowest child level setting. I know that I've, I have um, protected that child who's in my home or any other guest in my home. And I can have a peace of mind that um, they are not going to get involved in anything they shouldn't. Um, also with games here, I have uh, one of the ways that we, uh, we provide help is uh, for my son to, to be busy is we have his friends actually bring Xboxes over. We have a couple of TVs we set up, they have game day. All their game systems goes under games and they cannot get to the internet and go surfing or do anything else. My whole goal is to help families to simplify screen time management. There's so much I could go through today. There's so many layers There's so much information that I have to help you. And I would love the opportunity uh, to go to even go deeper on even at the app level, like what's really going on discord and how do you know that your children are having the appropriate conversations because when you look at those screens, they look so chaotic. If you don't know how to click on the right thing, you're not going to see that those hidden servers have hidden content from parents. So I love to teach about that. So one of the things I do is I teach about awareness. I teach about managing all of your stuff, all of your devices through your own phone, even the family screen time agreement. So I, I have a process that I walk families through to build a family screen time agreement so that they are all on the same page and understand this is not a contract. It's way more in depth and it can live on your phone so you can just pull it up anytime. Age appropriate boundaries, time limits, and um, access limits. For access limits, um, it's even about the physical, where does that device live? So real quickly, I call these the five befores. Before you buy a device, really think about what it's going to be used for. Is it going to collaborate with the other systems you have? What's the best way to manage it? Does it come with parent controls? Look and make sure, does it have internet access? All those different things that we don't sometimes think about. I also teach about before you give a device, making sure that you're the one that logs in first, that you set it up with all the right settings. So for example, if you buy your child a laptop for homeschool or even um, you know, for just for fun, if they're the first person that logs on, then they're the admin of the account. And then you have to switch it back and log in yourself to really set up um, the settings. So it's just things to think about the befores. Before you make changes, make sure you test them out try it on a younger child before a teenager, whatever you can do to avoid uh, a meltdown before you download apps. I have a recommended um, set of sites to test to make sure that those apps are actually what they say they are. And before you give more access, really make sure your child's ready for it. Remember, it's about brain development, not that they're a good kid, not that they're uh, trustworthy, um, this is brain development because they are going to be literally approached on a daily basis. So one thing that I, um, I'm going to offer, and Terry's going to go more into depth on, um, on this, but what I really do is I help people with a call to just go through an assessment. We look at all the different um, devices you have. We walk through those two main steps that you can do because it's free. There's, you don't have to pay for any of those things that, that I just shared with you. Um, you can set up the, the boundaries. I literally can make a iPhone a dumb phone a, it, that it literally can just call and text and only who I allow it to call and text. It can be done. You just have to make sure you have the right settings in the right places. So these are just some of the things that I can do um, that I that I teach on and why I think you know having an agreement in, in place is good. The one thing I would say about that is having an agreement is different than a contract and it helps the family feel like they're part of the solution and not that you're helicoptering or, or being too demanding. So that's it, Terry. That is what I wanted to share today. I hope, um, I hope that that is helpful for everyone. And I will, if you wanna take over sharing, that would be great. Yeah, <clears throat> um, it says uh, you have to end it, your side of it. Oh, do it? Okay. Yeah. Well, let me figure out how to do that.
um, at the little at the bottom, there's a little share screen. Yeah, you had to get back to that menu. So yeah. let me. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm trying to do that. Hmm. Let's see what happens if I do this. I think you should be able to just try to share yourself. Let's see. It's not letting me. Um, it's not letting me open that. Let me see. Oh, All there. Right. I got I it. I okay. Um, I'm not muted, right? No. Okay. All right, guys, I hope that was um, helpful. That was a little bonus because um, over and over and over and over again, I keep seeing this whole, um, the whole screen time um, thing is such a huge issue with everybody. Um, uh, it's, it's the number one biggest um, opposition point that comes up is, um, is the, the screen time use and the dangers of the internet. So um, Gina's got a lot of really good information and she can really, really help you guys come up with a plan um, to manage that. So, um, um, and I wanted to, uh, I just wanted to say, so now that we know it can be done safely, right? right um, maybe some screen time, um, some screen time breaks, um, well, we're going to get we're going to get back to the myths of unschooling now that we've covered the whole screen time thing. So while it seems counterproductive at first, allowing your teen to leave the traditional school system gives them the freedom and the flexibility to pursue what inspires them, and that inevitably fuels their fire to learn what they need to succeed um, in their you know when they finally get to their chosen career path. Um, so I just wanted to, we've covered the, the hot opposition points. We've talked a little bit about um, uh, self-directed learning and unschooling. And um, I just wanted to give you some quick steps, eight steps to get started. If you're looking to start unschooling, um, or yeah, I mean, some of you may already be doing it. Some of you may be considering it in the future. Um, or thinking about it here coming up. So you, first of all, you make the decision, you wanna get them out of school and you wanna homeschool or, or unschool. Um, you wanna check your state's laws for homeschooling and file the required paperwork. You've got three options. You can, most states will let you do it on your own, file the required paperwork, take care of the reporting on your own, whatever it is they require. Um, some require yearly testing, some require more stuff, some require less. Um, you can enroll in an umbrella school, which depending on the umbrella school, it, um, it basically an umbrella school takes the pressure off of you for the requirements for the state. Um, and some of them may or may not help you navigate this. You still have to file that you're homeschooling under an umbrella school. And some of the schools will help you navigate those, those filing requirements. Um, but generally, once you go under an umbrella school, then your, um, your, your requirements aren't as stringent. And then the other option is to roll in a program like ours um, that offers guided self-directed programs for your student. And then in, in that respect, you're actually enrolled in a national private high school and it, it um, depending on your state, they may or may not require you to do the homeschooling paperwork, but like our school, we handle all of that for you. So we take care of it. Um, and then the third step after you navigated all that and you've taken all those things under your, under your gotten them all down. Um, the third thing you wanna do is de-school. And that's not unschooling. Um, de-schooling is just completely taking a break from the rigors of the traditional classroom academic system. So if, you're, if your child has been in a normal school where they go and they sit in a classroom all day and they listen to teachers and blah, 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 you want to give them an opportunity to not think about school, not think about algebra, all those things. And most of the time when we're pulling our kids out, it's because they're at wit's end and they are so stressed. And us as parents, we are stressed. 
And so I recommend, and everybody else recommends, and it's a really good thing, trust me, to just pull them out, take a couple months off, figure out what your plan's going to be, and don't stress. Don't mention algebra. Don't mention reading. Don't mention anything. Let your kid just be. And um, this goes naturally into unschooling because that's you know, basically you're just letting them um, start that whole process. But even if you're going to regularly homeschool your child and do some academics, take a break. Um, number four, talk to your children about their interest. Start trying to figure out what interests them. I, I've noticed with a lot of high schoolers, um, you know, when you talk to them about what it is they want to do with their life, some of them, some of them got it, but a lot of them are, um, they're so brain dead. They're, they're, they're so beat down and, and depressed and angry or whatever. And they're like, I don't know, you know, they really don't know. So it's kind of a gentle conversation that happens. Um, I wouldn't start talking about their interest before you de-school, before you take that big break. But if it starts coming up, hey, I, I'd love to learn this, or I want to do that. You know, I, I was talking to a teen the other day and they really wanted to get into welding. They wanted to learn welding. So when it comes up, then start helping them explore it. So number five, provide books, games, supplies, field trips, opportunities, et cetera, that engage your child. Um, if you don't know what their particular interests are and you can't tell from observing them and stuff, just start strewing the stuff in their path. That's what we call it in the homeschool world. You know, books for things like my son was really into Minecraft. So we got some really cool Minecraft books and, um, you know, different games. My daughter loves herbs and, and growing things like that. And um, we got her a really cool game that's um, based on herbs and herbal medicine. Um, you can, you can get supplies if they're interested in arts or, you know, anything, and then field trips and opportunities and stuff that just ex start exposing them to stuff. And then six, allow them to lead. So allow them to say, you know what? Mm, I don't want to go to the science museum. I hate the science museum. So don't go to the science museum, allow them to tell you what they like and they don't like. And at first it's gonna feel like they don't wanna do anything or don't like anything, but trust me, that will change. Um, support them as a mentor and a facilitator and not as a teacher. You know, you're not, you're not teaching them algebra, you're not teaching them anything. You're guiding them, facilitating, mentoring. Um, and then the most important thing is have fun. I mean, once you start unschooling, gosh, I can't even begin to tell you how fun it is. Um, it's, it's just really been a super blast. So I wanted to um, open it up and see if anybody had questions. Um, I wanna also just let you guys know that I, I do have a school and we have programs, but I do a lot of consulting for folks that are looking to start self-directed learning. Um, I do a blueprint call that's normally about $89 and we spend an hour and we just deep dive and I help you navigate your state's requirements. Um, I walk you through all of these steps. We come up with a really good plan that you can implement that, you know, for the first quarter of your um, unschooling um, adventure. And um, so folks have been, folks really love it because it takes the worry out of it. I help hook you up with some mentors and some resources and um, and really take the guesswork out of it and hold your hand and, and help you make feel good about it. But um, during the webinar, we're gonna just do it as a special for $47. And also Gina has um, a, a one hour call that she does too, that she does for $47. And Gina, I don't know if you're still there. Um, are you yeah. still, yeah. So I, I know that we wanted to like give a bigger special for folks that were on that wanted a little extra handholding on these two topics and give them a $10 discount on both. And um, yes, so that is, that is available. We have that okay. available today. Okay. okay, great. So do you wanna just put a link in the chat? Um, sure just for folks for that? Yeah, so I'll put the link in that this is a, a combo. So if you wanted to um, get both of these offers and make sure you are really set up solid, 
then I'm going to send give the link to that or you can just at that same link you can just access the tech information if that's where you're wanting to start and then I think um Tara you have a link if they just wanted to reach out to you for yeah your... I'll just put I'll put my direct link in if they want to just do the um my my coaching thing um that, that's so so they're all there if anybody needs like further direction I mean you can reach out email me talk to me in the alternatives to high school group um or if you want a little more in-depth help with these things then we're certainly willing and able to do that for you if you just sign up with the the calendly link or the other link um i am going to stop the screen sharing maybe um stop share all right and i'm just going to open it up to questions i know there's um some folks on here that may have questions does anybody does anybody have any questions specifically that they want to to ask anything that they still have concerns about with unschooling nice bear give up on Garza. Hey. Um, hey, I have a question. I really liked your talk. It was really interesting. Um, so point number seven um, about unschooling, how will they be well-rounded if they just focus on, if they don't focus on one thing? Um, so that's really good. I like the holistic learning approach, but what happens, for example, with physics or biology? Like at some point you have to sit down and learn the concepts. Um, I think you can learn things all together if you go on a field trip, if you play games. But aren't there some things that you kind of have to sit down and just study more like from a textbook? Um, so specifically, you mentioned like some of the sciences? Or the maths. So the math, so what kids need in math is not algebra. And and um, I mean, a lot of times when you talk to the teachers about it, they're like, oh, well, we require it because we want to be able to teach critical thinking. Well, when you are doing this, Liz, like if you start this all along, your child's critical thinking skills are gonna be phenomenal. So critical thinking skills are smushed in a normal classroom setting because it's, it, you're told what to do, when to do it, how to do it, you know, everything is laid out for you all day long. And um, when you were homeschooling or unschooling, um, it's, it's not like that. The students are, are much better at critical thinking. And algebraic thinking is like finding for the missing thing. And, and there's, some, there's some really cool games out there that you can get your kids to play that, that do that. There's websites that support it. But what I have found with unschooled kids is they learn the mass that they need, you know, managing money, finances, um, a lot of that stuff they learn by being with and watching their parents. Um, and uh, most of the kids that graduate high school don't have an understanding of algebra. And that's one of the biggest complaints that the colleges have is um, the kids coming in, they're required to take these maths for school and they, they don't have an understanding of it. So the government is saying you need to have algebra uh, one and two, but real life doesn't necessarily um, equate. Carrie, um, can, I, uh, can I share my data points on that? Do you mind if I jump Sure, that, that's fine. Okay. That'd be great. Awesome. So yeah, so I worked with um, data collection agencies around like scholarship and college enrollment for years. And so one of the things that we knew was that we needed to have um, algebra, like if what they were trying to prove is if you had algebra by ninth grade, then you were going to be successful all the way through college. I'm telling you the data does not show that. Um, they want it to show that. They're trying really, really hard to make it show that, but that is not the case. And here's the reason why it's not the case. And one reason why it's really good that it's not the case is because when I went to my school district and I asked them about their math levels, all eighth graders were coming in anywhere from a second grade into algebra. We're coming in from a second grade math level to um, at, the, at the highest, a sixth grade math level. And he was going to have to pass them in algebra at some, at some level. So they weren't really going to be at an algebra level. So I think there's a lot of myths around algebra levels. 
And I think that in homeschool, if that is something, so there's a lot of families that just have a tradition or like a value around math, right, as a skill. You can learn algebra way faster one-on-one -on -one with a parent through a online program if that is your desire, way better than if you're going to learn it, than they're, they're going to learn it in this classroom setting with kids completely disrupted and on their phones all day. So that's kind of the data points and uh, experience there. Does that answer your question, Liz? Yeah, no, that was really interesting. Um, but like, what if the kid wants to be, for example, um, an engineer or an architect and they have to study the really advanced stuff? I agree, in normal life, we don't need algebra. We don't need that right. kind of stuff. But in some cases, they might. So I'm not sure how that So my out. son's been unschooled his entire life. And um, he is 15. He just turned 16. And he's actually seriously thinking about engineering. And once they find a path that they're interested in, they will learn whatever they need to support that path. Um, and I, I've seen that. I've seen it over and over and over and over again. I, kids, kids that are able to independently learn, fill in the gaps that they're going to need for whatever thing that they're choosing to do. And kids that are in a traditional school system, you know, if you walk up to a kid on the street and ask them a general biology question, nine times out of 10, they're not going to be able to answer it or a general history question or a general. So even though they're learning it, you know, and they're passing the test, once they hit that summer break, it's gone. You know, once they graduate, it's gone. Um, so they're, when, they, when they're able to dive deeper and really study what they wanna study, whatever supporting things they need for that, they, they pick up. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think it sounds to me kind of like you give them the base when they're young and you kind of do games and you play. And then if they find their own interest, then they can pursue the more advanced things if they would like. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's I would also just like to add really quickly on that too, is that a lot of um, kids that when we were looking at all the data that were lower in, in algebra or didn't even have algebra by ninth grade, they learned faster and better in a college setting yeah. than they did in high school. And the way that colleges teach it is, is in a way that makes it more real life applicable for them. And so they, they have a better desire to learn it. You know, we, we were able to see that grade, the grade averages um, in algebra in college were much higher. And the other thing to note about the data was that even if they passed with high grades in high school, they scored really low in college and needed to take the, the, those college credits and learn. That's where they learned. That's where they were learning. Math was, was better in college. Yeah, I could share um, like my own story. I know it's been a couple of years, but um, when I was in high school, um, I did not want to be there. I, I was only there because it was actually a much safer environment than my home. But um, when I was there, I was worried all the time and I wasn't interested in school and I wasn't interested in learning. And um, I just, <laughs> I just hated it. I was, I was bored. I was miserable. I wasn't challenged. I didn't challenge myself. I hadn't learned how to. And, um, and I had been told not to, you know, not to even bother about college. So my, my grade point average in high school was like a 2.7 or something. It, it wasn't atrocious, but it wasn't great. Um, and then I decided that I had a passion for marine mammals and I, I did a whole bunch of research on my own and, um, and this was back before the internet. And I found a college that had a professor, a new professor who studied marine mammals and he was the one who figured out where um, the red blood cells are made in manatee and that was just like so exciting for me. And, um, and so I wanted to go to that college. And with my 2.7 grade point average and my total lack of participating in anything in school except math, because I did love math, um, I applied to the college. And of course, I got, I got rejected. And um, the college wrote, you know, their rejection letter, you know, the, the Dear John letter. And at the bottom of it, they made the mistake of saying, you know, if you would like us to reconsider for any reason, just write us back. 
And so I did, I did because it was the, it, it was for me, it was my whole future. And, um, and I, and I was really excited about the possibilities there. And um, I wrote them back and they actually accepted me. They, they wrote me back and they said, okay, you know what? We're going to accept you conditionally on probation. So I spent my first semester on probation and I took the test to get into college, you know, to figure out where I would be placed in math, math. I did great in um, writing, communicating, all of that stuff. Horrible. It was horrible. So they made me start at the very beginning of the, um, of the writing, you know, composition. And I was required to take three semesters of composition because I was, I was so bad. And I took the first class and I loved it. The environment at the college, so completely different than high school, complete, just like, you know, what Gina says, the data shows, it's so, it's such a real thing. Um, I did so well in my composition class that my instructor urged me to retest because he said I wouldn't need to take any more that I wrote so amazingly well. And, um, and I did, and I didn't need any more composition classes. But one of the biggest lessons I learned from my own experience, and then in the, you know, 40 years since then, is that whatever you need to learn for a college degree, you're going to learn it at college. High school is not a preparation for college. You know, that's that's what they like you to think and that's how they tout it, but it's not. Um, I know so many students who did poorly or were homeschooled or unschooled completely, no schooling at all that have just done phenomenal in the college um, atmosphere versus kids who had all the AP classes and the high SAT scores that failed out the first semester. So, um, it's not, it's not what we're led to believe. It really isn't. Does anybody else have any questions? Damon, do you have any questions? Um, you're muted, Robin. No, I'm oh, there you muted. Go. Actually, um, <laughs> I was waiting for you to call me. Um, I'm just, a question for Gina. How much screen time is recommended for a student? Gina, are you there? Gina's muted. Ah, sorry, I was muted. That's what it was telling me. <laughs> yes, I can share some recommendations. So, you know, if you look at what the physicians recommend, it's really, really low. It's, it's so low that when I share it with families, they kind of laugh. Like, you know, little kids under the age of 10 should almost have zero. Well, we know that's not what's really happening. Um, so I really think that it, it, it depends. What, what I usually recommend is putting it in buckets. So there's the education bucket. So that's the purpose. It's a very purposeful reason. And um, then there is the you know, playtime bucket. And so just making sure that you're really balancing that out and that it's only a couple hours a day. And the main thing about screen time is, that, is taking breaks. So there, there shouldn't be four hours on the screen and not even for us adults at a time. Um, if we are on it for two hours, we should even a, a, try to take a bathroom break, breaks within those two hours. We have, I have a lot of kiddos that have uh, bowel issues because of that, that I work with. Um, and also uh, their eyesight can be. So, so looking away from the screen and trying to see the farthest thing they can see and kind of stare on it. So sometimes if you're, you know, you're at home with your kids, you're going to be able to remind them, say, hey, look up from, you know, look up. They're not having that, those conversations in the public school. Those are the things that they need to start to start thinking on. So no more than a couple hours a day, if possible, with uh, a lot of time away up and around, moving around um, is, is recommended. I would say if they're on a phone, even less time because uh, it's, it affects the neck and the body formation of always looking down on the phone and then the straining of the eyes um, is really bad. And you can manage all of that through tech solutions. You don't have to be the harper of how much time are you on? You can literally set it up to help manage that. Good question, Robin, thank you. All right, I'm sorry, Damon, did you have a question? No, no, I didn't. I mean, it's been very enlightening. Um, you know, I, I, I've, uh, like I said, $2, one is in, in more of a 
traditional school settings, actually a performing arts school. So I guess it's not quite as traditional. No, that's awesome. Yeah, and then the younger one, uh, it, it's uh, her mother has, uh, uh, you know, chosen to take the path of uh, homeschooling, and so we pulled her out uh, earlier this year. So, you know, I had some concerns, um, you know, that she would get uh, everything she needed to get in terms of her, you know, education and growth and development. Because I, you know, I went all the way uh, in terms of traditional schooling. Um, so it's been enlightening. I think she actually tricked me into getting on here for that reason. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, she had to work and she said, oh, you know, can you, do you have time to jump on this, um, Zoom oh. call? Message? So, but I think she did it for that reason, but, uh, no, but it's been, it's been enlightening. I appreciate it. Well, that's good. I'm glad. I mean, if you have any other questions or concerns about homeschooling or unschooling, um, we're happy to help answer them. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. All right. All right, guys. Well, if there aren't any other questions, Liz, I applaud you for um, taking this on at the very beginning and thinking about it. Um, you know, when um, my... <laughs> My daughter had problems in the public school because she was incredibly bright and um, and it was a, it, at kindergarten, she was already bored out of her wits and we couldn't get her put in an advanced placement class. So I pulled her out and I put her in a private school and um, what turned out is the private school was just more of the same. It just cost a lot of money. I mean, there were some really neat advantages to it, but um, when it came down to it, the, the couple of their teachers weren't very weren't very good. And um, her first grade teacher taught everyone everyone in her class, not just my daughter, to hate math with all, with a passion. And then the second grade teacher, you know, at the end of the year, my my daughter's got all great marks, and she's. Um, She's, uh, she's at the top of her class and everything's, you know, in exemplary, except maybe her social skills on the playground, but she had had some losses that she was still dealing with. But so the teacher pulls me aside at the end, you know, you have your parent teacher conversation at the end of the year, this is second going into third. And there's a little chair outside the door for the kids to sit at so the parent can talk to you about the issues with your kid right. So she's like, oh no, you know, bring her in. And so I brought her in and, and she's like, well, I just wanted to let you know that I'm, I'm, I'm considering holding Aaron back. And I'm like, I'm like, excuse me. And now my daughter's in the room with me and she's a second grader. And um, I was like, what do you mean hold her back? She's like, her report card doesn't indicate she needs to be held back. And this woman is like, well, she daydreams. I'm like, okay. She's always looking out the window. She's never paying attention in class. I'm like, okay, but she does well on the test, right? Yes, yeah, she always does really well on the test. I'm like, okay, and she does her homework. She gets a hundred on everything. So why would you hold her back? Well, because if she doesn't get that under control, she is never going to amount to anything. This second grade teacher told me that in front of my daughter, told her that she was never going to amount to anything. And I was like, okay, we're done. <laughs> we are done. So I pulled her out to homeschool and I did what a lot of parents do. And I brought the, home, the school schedule home. And I was teaching that I was, you know, I was like, okay, you're going to be at the table by 830 and we're going to study this. And we had the little academic blocks all laid out and my daughter turns out was just as miserable at home as she was at school and I was actually in the process of getting an education degree um and this is what we were being taught that in classroom remediation and I kept thinking there's got to be a better way there has to be a better way and when I got that job offer in 2011 you know I was kind of toying with the idea of of relaxing the school and um and so it got very relaxed because my dad didn't care. He just played with the kids. He helped my son build Legos and, you know, he didn't, he didn't really do anything for their education. So, um, you know, I was kind of hanging on by a thread. And then when my daughter started, you know, like really 
showing me all the stuff that she was doing and learning because nobody was helicoptering her um, and forcing her to learn something she wasn't interested in. I was just astounded. And I'm like, okay, I, I'm, I'm done here. I'm just going to let go and I'm going to let this process happen. And it has been an amazing journey. You know, at 12 years old, she decided we had a farm. She decided she wanted to, um, she'd been in the goat club. She decided she wanted to do a goat business. And she heard that the USDA gave youth loans. So she found out what she needed for the youth loan through her 4-H leader. And she put together a financial packet, um, how much the goats were going to cost and how much she could make off of them. And she created a little business plan and she took it to the USDA and they gave her $5,000 to start her business. And she'd never been able to do that if we were forcing the academics and not allowing, you know, all of that other stuff to happen. It, it's just, it's an amazing, amazing journey. And when I told friends about, you know, the whole unschooling process years and years and years ago before, you know, it was a thing, um, I got, well, of course your kids are gonna go academic, you know? And I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. This isn't because they're my kids. This is, this is what happens when you let them go and those sparks get lighted and they start a fire. I mean, they start a forest fire of learning in their heads. It's just, it's unbelievable. So I just wanted to share that, um, Liz. So, you know, the fact that you're doing this, at, at, thinking about all of this ahead of time and you can make these decisions now and you're not gonna be, you know, struggling against all the programming that we all have had to, to burn through and let go of is, is phenomenal. And Damon, kudos to you for considering this. It's so hard, isn't it? <laughs> It, it's, can be. Yeah. it is really hard to let go and trust that process so um you know i i get it i was there i was really there um as a matter of fact at one point i ended up switching my degree because i did not like what they were teaching teachers and um so instead of getting my teacher certification i ended up making it a a, a minor um and and i and i go about the whole teaching thing in in other ways so um, Can I ask one last quick question? Sure. Um, I really like the story about your daughter. That's amazing with her business. That, that's really oh, yeah. inspiring. It's, it's um, been fun. Yeah. I'm from Canada. I grew up homeschooled. Now I live in Spain. Um, my husband is Spanish. And we're just concerned about homeschool community um, because homeschooling isn't even legal here. It's like illegal. It's kind of like a gray a zone in the middle. And there's not a lot of homeschool families. It's, it's not well known. Um, so we're just thinking, like I know homeschool community is important like I I lived it when I was young it's very important but what would you suggest if it's difficult to find other homeschoolers in your area um so you said you're in Canada I grew up in Canada oh but you're I'm in Spain Madrid, and oh. yeah my husband is Spanish so, so I have um it's funny because the German students that come it's illegal in Germany and so they come and they're like but I actually know folks that do it in Germany even and it's not even legal there um the, the best thing to do to find a community in an area where um, those numbers might be low is, I mean, you may have to do stuff more virtually or, or do some, a little bit of traveling once or twice a year to an area where events or things are happening. Um, but you so you're looking for, so you'll, you will be looking for, um, or you can move to an area where it's a little bit friendlier um, um, Madrid sounds fascinating though. So thanks for joining us from across the ocean, eh? Um, so, uh, do, I have a couple of ideas. So Liz, what, what about, um, you know, I think is, is your question really about the, the homeschool, you know, kind of connection or is just making sure they're getting socialized because there's other things that you could probably do in the community like around normal school, after school hours, right? To make sure that kids are getting plugged in with other kids. Um, and you could even start your own kind of after school um, tutoring type thing or after school something where other kids can come and whether it's baking together or- Yeah, some kind of club. Something. Yeah, you could start your own, your own club that doesn't necessarily have to conform to homeschooling, but more meeting that need for your own kids. And- a bonus for the others in the neighborhood, right? 
Yeah, but that's a that's a good idea. point. Um, when my son was interested in archaeology, we did like an archaeology club, and we would have kids come over and um, and and do all kinds of cool kid oriented archaeology activities. Um, like one time we we baked a, a cake and stuff stuff and all the in so in layers of it and then they excavated the cake like you would on an archaeology dig <laughs> it, was, it was so much fun so that's the kind of thing once you figure out what your kids are interested in you can you can have you know you can have a, a cooking party or this you know and just kind of do different things and invite neighbors kids over do it on the weekends or at night yeah, that's a great idea Gina you know, that makes a lot of sense because since I was, I grew up homeschooled, I have the idea that you need a homeschool group. You have to do things just with them, but you can do things with anyone. So those are great ideas. Well, it's funny because um, with my high school that I had, we did a ton of stuff with the Virginia State University programs. So my kids were mixed in with, um, we were, we did stuff with their small farm programs and their, um, their farm and ranch programs and stuff. And, and these teenagers were mixed in with adults and veterans and all kinds of people that were, you know, starting farms and working on projects. And I mean, they learned about technology on the farms and, um, um, you know, those little hovery things and all kinds of stuff. So yeah, mixing the ages and the, and the groups is, is awesome. And, and it doesn't have to be a homeschooling group. Absolutely not. There's a Facebook group called homeschooling Spain. I don't know what it's about because it was all in Spanish and I, I just looked real quick. I put in homeschooling in Spain and there's a group on Facebook. So if you speak Spanish, you may want to check that out. Yeah, cool. Thanks. I'll, I'll look into it. All right. All right. So do you guys have any more questions? No. Well, we can probably wrap this up. It was good of you guys to be here and we'll put a replay link. I'll make an announcement to the folks that um, signed up that couldn't be here. And we'll put a replay in the um, in the alternatives to high school group for everybody. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach us, reach out to us in the group or um, message me on Facebook. Damon, thanks for coming. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry you got swindled into it, but I'm glad you're here. No, it was actually <laughs> worth, it was well worth my time. Oh, good. I, I spent a that. lot, a lot of time on Zoom calls that aren't worth it. So, oh. it <laughs> to stay, so. well, that's good. I appreciate that feedback. Thanks. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, I'm gonna um, go ahead and end it. There's some links in the chat. We'll put them in the Facebook group too. So, um, if nobody has any more questions, I'll go ahead and and say goodbye. All right. Thanks. Thanks again. All right. Thanks. Have a good day. Bye, guys. Thank you.